Good morning, Greenwood. It is certainly our pleasure to be with you this morning as you celebrate the anniversary of your pastor, uh, Pastor Makita Carroll. It has been our pleasure to be with you over the past 10 years or so as you have uh, honored him uh, on this special day. Uh, it's a little challenging uh, for us, for my wife and I, uh, not to be in Kansas City physically with you uh, on today. Uh, as we are sharing with you, we just give God praise and honor and glory, though, for the technology and for the medium uh, that will enable us um, to share with you as we practice physical distancing in this COVID-19 season. Uh, we certainly miss being in Kansas City. Uh, we miss uh, our Jack Stack barbecue and our lunch, uh, Pastor Carol, with you on Saturday. Uh, we certainly miss uh, hanging out with Malachi, and I'm sure my wife will miss uh, all of the shopping that she does downtown at the Arts Festival. Uh, and so we do pray that uh, on next year, uh, we will be able to come and to share with you uh, in person. Uh, but we again, we thank God for this privilege and this opportunity uh, to share. Before we get into our message, let me ask you if you would, if you would turn to Exodus chapter 14. That's where we're going to bring the message from today, Exodus chapter 14. Uh, and while you're turning there, we want to give all praise and honor and glory to God, uh, the Father, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the precious Holy Spirit. I have mentioned Dr. Suzette, and we're grateful to her for all of her support for 32 years of marriage. Uh, just a wonderful uh, wife and a wonderful first lady and uh, very supportive in all of the things that she does. Uh, we thank God for you, Pastor Carol, and for Lady Carol and all of the support that you give uh, and to the members of Greenwood. Uh, God bless you. We love you. And we do uh, pray that you would continue to not only honor, uh, but to heed the voice and to follow the leadership of your uh, pastor. Uh, let us, um, as we have found Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10, let us have a word of prayer. Uh, and then we will jump really right into uh, what we want to share with you on this morning. Uh, gracious God, we give you thanks and praise. We give you glory and honor. We magnify, exalt, and lift up your holy and righteous name. Uh, we recognize above everything else that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the ruler and the controller of our lives, and we praise you for that. Now, Father, I pray by your spirit uh, that you would fill me, that you would help me to decrease uh, that you might increase all of the things that you've placed in my heart. Oh, Father God, I pray that you would pour them out uh, upon the hearts and the minds of your people, that we might hear your voice uh, and not mine, uh, that we might walk in your wisdom and in your ways. And that indeed, oh, Father God, as you speak to us, you will give us wisdom, insight and courage to go from where we are to the places that you desire for us to be. Satan, we remind you that you're defeated. And, and we take full authority over you in the name of Jesus. And now, Father, in this preaching, teaching moment, manifest yourself as only you can. In Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen and amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 14, uh, beginning at verse 10, uh, reading and teaching from the New King James Version of the Bible. Uh, and it reads as follows. And when Pharaoh drew near... The children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. I want to use from this text uh, your theme uh, for this celebration, uh, leading God's people from panic to promise. Leading God's people from panic to promise. 
the black church in America is needed more today than ever. America is at a moral, a political, and an economic crossroads. Like other powerful, influential nations throughout history, America is on the brink of demise. In fact, America is already losing position and status on the world scene. At the root of America's falling is racism, greed, and chauvinistic narcissism. Beginning with the nomination of Barack Obama as president of the United States, the racism, the injustices, and the inequities that many of us thought were dead are reawakened. Today, we see marching, violence, state-supported abuse, and poly-supported supported injustices perpetrated against people of color that is like what we saw prior to the civil rights movement. Now as then, many people are ignoring the presence and the prevalence of racially motivated discrimination, of injustices and inequities. Now, like then, the hand of God is uncovering this phenomena and making them more and more difficult to ignore. Briefly, uh, Greenwood, let me remind you that on September the 20th, 2019, one year ago, I spoke prophetically that we have entered a season of divine judgment, uh, that God is uncovering the unrighteousness, the injustices, uh, the injustices and evil of church, kingdom, and civic leaders, leaders who are neglecting and mistreating the masses, leaders who are committing fraud for selfish gain. God is especially concerned about the neglect and the abuse of the least of these. Hebrews 10, 31 through 32 remind us that vengeance belongs to God and that is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God of all judgment. I remind us that God is looking for a remnant of kingdom citizens, people who will live in accord with God's word and spirit, people who will confront injustices with righteous indignation while trusting God to exact the vengeance that is needed to manifest divine righteousness in the earth. Like the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, God is uncovering evil, discrimination, and injustices, making them more and more difficult to ignore. God is again raising up a remnant that will provide courageous and persistent leadership to challenge the perpetrators of these injustices. Today's text reminds us that God has always called and raised up leaders for times like these. In Kansas City, Missouri, Pastor Carroll is one of those leaders and the Greenwood family is a part of the remnant. As Pastor Carroll provides kingdom leadership, Greenwood, you must follow that leadership. God has called him to lead you from a place of panic to promise. Pastor Carroll in Greenwood, you are poised to make a kingdom impact on this city, an impact that will speak to the social and economic injustices and disparities that have a disproportionate negative impact on people of color, color and other poor and marginalized groups. To that end, I will use your theme and your text, leading God's people from panic to promise out of Exodus chapter 14 to shed light on seven things that you must know and that you must do in this season if you are to walk in the destiny, the promises that God has ordained for you in this season. Recall that in Exodus 14, God has led the Israelites out of bondage into the wilderness. They are on their way to the promised land, but they have not yet landed in the promised land. They are in a strange and an unfamiliar place. Interestingly, that place is called freedom. Freedom, this strange and unfamiliar place comes with a great deal of uncertainty and responsibility that is frightening to many people. Uh, where we are going to live, uh, how are we going to eat, Will we survive the trip from the wilderness to the promised land are all questions that run through the mind of people when we move from bondage to freedom. Uh, they know where they have come from, but they are not quite sure about where they are going. Uh, at this point, uh, where they have come from is more comfortable to them simply because it is more familiar. Now, for the seven things you must know and do to get from where you are to where God is taking you, from the wilderness 
to the promised land. For you, Pastor Carol, a, a 10 year journey, a trek through dangerous and unfamiliar territory. What are the things that we can glean from this text that will help you to know and do what you need to do to get from panic to promise? Let's dig into this text and see these things. Uh, number one, and I'm going to list each one and then we'll dig through the text to verify or to underscore uh, the biblical principles uh, related to each one of these things that we must know and or do. Number one, uh, if we're going to get from panic to promise, from the wilderness uh, to, uh, to prosperity, uh, we must know that God has led you into your place of panic. God has led you into your place of challenge, into your wilderness experience into unfamiliar territory that is uncertain and uncomfortable for us. Look at what the text says in verse number one. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel. God speaking to the leader and empowering the leader to speak to the people that they turn and camp before Piharath between Migdal and the sea. Opposite Beelzephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. So God is giving them specific instructions uh, uh, of where they are to go and where God is sending them is into a place where it is going to seem as if they are trapped and in trouble. God is sending them, God is leading them into their place of panic. Verse three, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has close them in. God is sending them into a place where it will seem like they are in bondage. It will seem like they are trapped and even their enemy will believe that they are trapped and will come after them uh, in a desire to take them over and take them back into the place where God has delivered them from. You must know that God has led you into your place of panic. The second thing that we need to know is that we need to know that God led you to the place of panic to bring honor and glory to God's self. Listen, never panic because of the actions of hard-hearted people. When you're in the place where God has led you, never panic because of hard-hearted people. Never panic because of unbelieving people. Never panic because people are murmuring, Pastor Carol, and complaining about the place that you find yourself in. Why? Because God has led you there, and not only has God led you there, but God has led you there to bring glory and honor to God's self. Look at verse four. God says, uh, go into this place in the wilderness where you are closed in, then I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Proverbs 21 and one says that the king's heart, it, the king's heart is in the hand of God and God turns it wherever God wants to turn it. This phrase, God hardened Pharaoh's heart uh, is a permissive phrase. It's a, it's a passive hardening rather than an active uh, hardening. It literally means uh, that God was uh, was was influencing Pharaoh's heart by God's spirit. And when God wanted to harden God's fa God Pharaoh's heart, then God removed his spirit from Pharaoh, left Pharaoh with the, with the own devices of his own heart, uh, which was evil and dark and hardened. And so uh, throughout the book of Exodus, if we look at where the Israelites have come from, uh, particularly during the 10 plagues, we saw seasons, we saw times where God would move upon Pharaoh's heart and uh, through plagues and through action, and would, would cause Pharaoh to say, you all can leave. And then God would withdraw the presence of God's uh, spirit from Pharaoh and Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. And so, so God was shaping and moving. Uh, God knew that Pharaoh did not want to obey him in the first place. And God only moved upon his heart to get Pharaoh to do what God wanted him to do. Uh, and then God would remove God's spirit when it was necessary uh, for Pharaoh, leave Pharaoh to his own own devices when it was necessary uh, for Pharaoh to do those things that would be of benefit to God's people. Never place your eyes on the actions of 
enemies, on the actions of people who are kicking against you. Always keep your eyes on God, for God is moving in your heart and even in the heart of those that are coming against you, that are persecuting you in order to bring about God's purpose. So we need not panic when people are trying to make life difficult for us, because what we understand is God is allowing them to act the way that they act so that God will bring honor and glory to God. Itself. Never panic because of the actions of hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And then God says, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants were turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? Wait a minute. God has moved upon Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh has allowed the Israelites uh, uh, to leave out of Egyptian bondage. Uh, Pharaoh has sent them away. But as soon as he sends them away, he realized that he was getting great benefits from the people. Listen, sometimes when people mistreat you, sometimes when people uh, 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 make sure that, that, that you don't receive justice and righteousness, they are doing that because they reap a benefit from it. People don't always want to admit that. It took, it took the Israelites leaving before Pharaoh would admit uh, that it was a benefit to him to exercise privilege and authority. Somebody ought to hear me this morning. Exercise privilege and authority over God's people that Pharaoh was keeping in bondage. And so in verse six, he says, uh, so he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Here he goes. The people have been delivered. The people have been set free. Pharaoh realizes uh, that, that, his, that the benefits that he was reaping from them are gone. So now he has hard, God has hardened his heart and he's going to go back after the people. He knows what God wants him to do. He knows what the right thing is to do, but he chooses to do the wrong thing. Why? Because he wants to benefit from the injustices and the unrighteousness that's being perpetrated against God's people. I hope somebody hears me uh, this morning. It says, and also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of e Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. There it is again. And he Perp and he pursued the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with boldness. When God has set you free, when God has sent you on a direction, when God has charted a course for you, go out with courage and boldness rather than fear. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pirath before Belzephon. So God has, has sent them out. Pharaoh has come at them. And now they are trapped between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. And they don't have any place to go. And that is where they panic. People panic, Pastor Carol, when they have been set free when they are on their way to the promised land, but they can't exactly see how they're going to get there. When difficulty come and, and uncertainty comes, uh, people will panic. And, and, and so the third thing that we need to know, and Pastor Carol, you really need to know this. The third thing that we need to know is that panic people always want to go back to what's familiar. Look at the text in verse 10. It says, and when Pharaoh drew near, get the picture, they are encamped against the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is coming after them. 
There's no place for them to go. God has miraculously delivered them. And now they're in a moment where God needs to deliver them again. But rather than having faith that God will continue to take them and lead them, they panic. He says, uh, and, the, and, and when, the chi- when the Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes. The New Revised Standard says they looked back. I'm telling you, panic people always want to go back to what's familiar. He they said they looked look back and behold the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses. They cried out to the Lord at, but they were speaking to Moses. Why? Because they understood that God was speaking to Moses. Greenville, if you want to get from panic to the promised land, you need to make sure that you understand that God is going to speak to you through your pastor, that God is going to lead you through your pastor. And Pastor Carol, you need, like Moses, uh, uh, to not take that lightly, but understand that it is your burden to hear from God and to speak to the people on behalf of God so that you can go into the places that God desires for you to go as you continue the journey from, from panic to promise. And so, and so, and, and so they began to speak. Uh, and, 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 and so that they were afraid, the Bible says, and they cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, verse 11, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. That's not true, but that's what they thought. And so they are reminding Moses of where they have come from because they want to go back to what's familiar. Remember, the wilderness uh, is not familiar. The wilderness even though they are free, uh, they are in a place of, uh, uh, of uh, unfamiliarity. Uh, so they are free, but they are still afraid. And Moses said to the people, uh, here, uh, uh, in, in, in verse number 13, uh, as we move to the next transition. So, so they want to go back and God is saying to them, you need to go forward. Watch this. And uh, the fourth thing that we need to know, the fourth thing that we need to learn if we're going to move from panic to promise is we must learn to trust God amid our panic. They panic because they were trapped. When you find yourself in a situation where you don't know where to go, you don't know what to do, you can't see what God is doing. Just trust God in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of the panic. Trusting God in the midst of the panic means at least two things, uh, and we'll dig this out of this text. Number one, it means trusting God. Uh, 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 trusting God means to be at peace, to be still, and to be quiet. The second thing is, is that when we trust God, God will deliver us permanently. When we trust God, God will deliver us permanently. Look at verse 13. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Don't panic. God has us here. Stand still and see the salvation, the deliverance of the Lord. When you don't know what to do, be still and watch God work on your behalf. He says, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. We must know that when we trust God, God will deliver us permanently. He says, you won't have to go through this again. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. You shall be still and you shall be quiet. When you don't know what to do and you don't know what to say, get in the presence of God, be still and be quiet and watch the Lord work on your behalf. The fifth thing that we need to know as we move from panic to promise, the fifth thing that we need to know is that once God delivers us, 
We need to keep moving forward. You say, keep moving forward, preacher. Where are they going to go? Pharaoh's army is behind them and the Red Sea is before them. But I heard somebody say that God will make a way, what? Out of no way. God will make a way where there is no way. When we trust in the Lord in the midst of our panic, we know that God will deliver us permanently and we will see God do things in our lives and on our behalf that only God can do. Our responsibility is to not look back, but rather to go forward. Remember in verse 10, it was when they looked back, when they looked up and saw Pharaoh's army coming, that they panicked. Don't look back, keep looking forward. And in fact, as you look forward, you must go forward. And as you go forward, be sure that you use what God has given you. Don't try to use what God has given somebody else. Use, Pastor Carol, what God has given you. Use Greenwood, your talents, your gifts, your experiences, your resources. Use what God has given you to go forward. Look at verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Well, we cry to you, God, because we don't know anybody else to cry to. But God is saying to Moses, but I've already spoken to you. I've already told you what to do. Stop looking back and go forward. He says, tell the children of Israel to go forward. That, that, that's the thing. Now, I'm going to sound a little strange right here, uh, but we need to stop asking God for direction and instruction when God has already given us direction and instruction. We need to stop asking God to do things for us that God has already done for us when God is simply waiting on us to move forward with what God has already given us. He says, but lift up your rod. There it is. Use what God has already given you. That God has already uh, caused Moses to use this rod, to use this staff, uh, uh, to work 10 plagues on the children of Israel. Moses knows what gifts he has. He knows how to use them. Greenwood, you know what God did for you. You know where he brought you from your old spot and into the school and you saw what he did. You, you saw the building that he brought you into and allowed you to pay it off uh, way before you thought you would be able to pay it off. You know what God has done for you. The only reason that you look back is just to be reminded of the great things that God has done for you, but you keep moving forward. And when God challenges you with a bigger challenge than you've already faced, just keep moving forward. It will be unfamiliar. It will be things that you think you can't do. But if you be still, you be quiet and you hear what the Lord is saying to you, God will indeed make a way out of no way. So stop asking God to do what God has already done. So he says to Moses, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the middle of the sea. What a familiar story, but I hope that it's new to you this morning. I hope that you can remember this morning that God made a road in the middle of the river and caused it to be dry, bone dry, so that the children of Israel can walk across it. Now, this is no fairy tale. This is no, this is, this is no, this is no cute little story. This is reality. This is what God actually did. And God is the same yesterday Today, today and forevermore. He may not need to take you through a river, but he'll take you through whatever he needs to take you through. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 43, God says, uh, in, it says to the children of Israel, in the past, I made a road through the river. Today, I'm going to make, I'm going to make rivers of water in the desert. In other words, whatever we need God to do for us, God will do for us if we trust him and keep moving forward. He says in verse 17, and indeed, uh, uh, and I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. God says, not only will I give you a pathway of escape, but I will allow those who are chasing you to come after you on the same path that I have created for you because they think uh, that they can do the same things uh, that you can do. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Once God delivers you, keep moving forward, no matter how unfamiliar, how uncomfortable, how uncertain that may feel. 
The sixth thing, and I'm almost at the end. The sixth thing that we need to do is we need to learn. We need uh, 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 when we stand still, when we're quiet, and when we use our God-given gifts, we need to know that God will work on our behalf. When we hold our peace, when we stand still, when we listen to God and walk with God, utilizing the gifts. Uh, God will work on our behalf. At least three things we see in this text that God will do for us. The first thing is, is that God will command our angels. God commands the angels that's been assigned to us. The second thing is that God will turn our darkness into light and God will cause our enemies to recognize that God is fighting our battle. And when our enemies understand that God is fighting our battles, it will be our enemies that will panic and not God. Once our enemies panic, we must resist the temptation of trying to take over and we must continue to allow God to work. We need to not mess up what God is doing. Let me make this clear. And I wish I had time to really dig through chapters, uh, verses 19 through 30, uh, but I, I don't have time to do all of that. But I would encourage you to look carefully at verses 19 through 30, because as they stood still and got quiet and used the gifts that God had given unto them, God began to work on their behalf. So God took, uh, God, God took the angel and moved the cloud from in front of them uh, to uh, behind them. And God set the cloud, the dark cloud uh, that was used uh, to guide them in the daytime. God set the cloud uh, in verses 19 through 30 in between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And God miraculously caused the cloud to make it dark for the Egyptians and light for the Israelites. Watch this. The same cloud that God used to shine light on the Israelites, he used it to put the Egyptians in darkness. God is trying to say to you, if you will stand still, if you will listen to my voice, if you will be quiet and use the resources that I've given unto you, I will work miracles in your life if you will not panic, but keep your eyes on the promise. And so, and so God, God, then God caused a, an, an east wind, the Bible says, to, to blow through the Red Sea. And the wind blew all night as the cloud held Pharaoh's army in pitch darkness. They were right there and they could have attacked, but they couldn't see how to attack because God was protecting them. And at the same time, God was drying out the Red Sea and giving the children of Israel light so that they could walk through on dry dry ground in what just a few hours ago was, 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 was the deep red sea. And so God was working miracles in their lives. Uh, uh, as the children of Israel went through on dry ground, through the Red Sea, through the tongue, with the waters up on beside them all through the night, and they get almost to the other side. Then God removes the cloud, and Pharaoh and his army begins to come after the children of Israel. And, and as they get into uh, the Red Sea, uh, 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 the text says that God removed the wheels. Some translators say, some commentators say uh, that God took mud and put it in the midst of the will. I don't believe that. Why? Because there was no mud in the Red Sea at this point. God had dried the Red Sea up. And, and most of the better translations say that God removed the wheels from them so that it was difficult. And the Egyptians recognized that God was fighting on behalf of the Israelites. I'm telling you, saints of God, I'm telling you, Greenwood, that if you will stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord, if you will trust in the Lord with your whole heart, heart, that God will indeed fight your battles. And when God is fighting for you, those who are fighting against you will recognize that God is fighting for you. And in this case, they tried to flee, but it was too late. For God said to Moses, now lift up your rod, let the waters flow back into the sea. And when the waters flow, flowed back into the sea, the very people who had hardened their hearts and who were coming against God's people and who had defied God, drowned in the Red Sea because God was trying to get glory to himself. But before they died, 
watch this. Before they died, they recognized that God was God and God got glory out of him. I heard somebody say somewhere uh, that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Don't be worried about people who are committing injustices and unrighteousness and discriminating against folk. Don't be worried about them. Sooner or later, they will recognize that God is fighting on your behalf if indeed you will allow God to move you from your place of bondage to freedom and from your place of, of, of freedom and uncertainty, from your pace, place of panic to the very promises uh, that God has for you. God will speak through your pastor, speak to you, and God will lead you in a way where that not only will you be set free, but God will poise you to make a tremendous difference in the lives of others who are suffering at the hands of these injustices, these inequities, uh, this discrimination that we talked about at the beginning of the message. Well, I'm almost done, but there's one last thing that I need you to see, uh, I, that I need you to know. Uh, and Pastor Carol, this is especially true for you, but it's also true for others of you, Greenville, uh, Greenwood, who are concerned and worried about members in your congregation who have not yet caught on to what God is doing in your midst. The seventh and final thing that you need to know is that some people will not believe God until they see God's miraculous works. I believe, Pastor Carol, that we are in a season of miracles. And I believe that we need to be seeking God to do some miraculous things in our lives so that some people will, in truth, will, will be able to see and truly believe that our God is God. Look at what the text says in verse 31. He says, thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant. Pastor Carol, don't expect people to believe you before they believe God. Don't expect people to follow you before they will follow God. And some of your people need to be able to see God do the things that only God can do before they can believe. I wish it were a different way, uh, but it's not. And you have to recognize that. Listen, beloved, God is in the process of judging the world for unjust, for injustices, for unrighteousness. There's a strong manifestation of this judgment uh, on the United States. God doesn't judge to destroy. God destroys to rebuild. God is looking for a remnant to work through in this season. God is looking for courageous leaders and a flock to follow that leadership. In judgment, God will honor and glorify God's self through the remnant and manifest God's kingdom in the earth. God's kingdom is built upon love, judgment, justice, righteousness, and peace. Here's what I want you to do this morning, Greenwood. I want you to know that God has led you from where you were to where you are. And God has placed you where you are because God wants to glorify God's self. And what you need to do is to hear the voice of God, in particular through your pastor. You need to be quiet and still long enough to recognize what God wants to do to you. And then you need to commit yourself to being obedient to the things that God is saying to you, particularly through your pastor, and watch God do miraculous works in your life uh, that will convince even your obstacles, even your enemies that God is indeed God and will convince those among you who are yet not sure about the vision and the purpose and the direction that God is going, uh, that is God is taking you, will convince them too that God's hand is upon your life. What you need to do is simply commit or perhaps in some cases, recommit yourself to following God today. Will you be a pastor, Pastor Carol? And will you be a church Greenwood uh, that God can work through to deliver marginalized people from Egypt to the kingdom? 
to deliver marginalized people from bondage to freedom, from an aimless wandering life to a life of divine purpose. If you are willing to commit or recommit today, I want you to affirm that commitment uh, as you repeat after me, wherever you are today, I want you to take a moment right now and I want you to pause. If you're moving around, I want you to pause. And, if, and, and, and as God is speaking to your heart, I want you to commit or recommit yourself to the Lord today as you pray with and affirm this commitment uh, through the words that I will speak. Um, uh, before we take you through this commitment, I would just ask uh, that you center yourself for a moment. Uh, I want to pray and then I want to take you through this recommitment. Father, we thank you for this day and we trust you that you've spoken to the hearts and to the minds of your people. And I ask you now by your spirit to grip every heart, every mind, every spirit, every soul. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Greenwood, would you pray with and affirm as we recommit ourselves to God today. Uh, repeat after me. Uh, Dear Lord, I affirm my faith and trust in you, the one true, living, almighty, all-knowing, ever-present, God, I commit myself to a life of discipleship. Help me to develop the character to keep moving forward. The courage to go where you are leading us. I trust you to guide direct, heal, and empower me. I trust you to fight and win the battles that are too difficult for me. Help me to trust in you with my whole heart, especially in areas where I lack understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Carol, God bless you and congratulations on 10 years of wonderful service. Please know that your best days are yet ahead as God leads you from a place of uncertainty and panic into promise. Greenwood, no. Uh, that this season that we are in is simply a season where God wants to show himself mightily through you and God wants to work through you as a church in the greater Kansas City area to be a blessing to those that others have given up on and left behind. God bless you and I love you. Hope to see you real soon.